Hey, welcome in on this uh, Bishop on Air Thursday evening. Uh, appreciate anybody who's tuning in right now. Typically, we go live uh, early in the mornings, but I've been on vacation all week doing a ton of uh, housework, uh, getting the yard ready for spring uh, before winter hits, and uh, figured, you know what, uh, give you guys something uh, a little fun here. So uh, hopefully you can hang out for the next 90 minutes or so. We're going to be watching a documentary I made back in 2014, but released it in 2015. Uh, and it's on YouTube already. Some of you may have seen it. I don't know. It's called Gun Free Zone, the movie. It's the story of Illinois getting the rights to not just keep, but bear arms whenever Illinois passed concealed carry. So as part of all of this and with the continued growth of this channel, thanks to a lot of you out there, uh, I'm blown away by the support. Uh, we do have a store where you can buy some merchandise. And uh, if you go to just my website, bishoponair.com, or on the YouTube channel, you can actually see below some of the items. Uh, but I'd encourage you to go check it out. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, you get uh, the logo on a variety of different things, stickers, shirts, hats, uh, hoodies, coffee mugs, a uh, variety of different things you can do. Uh, so if you want to support the show that way, you can. Uh, and actually, I'm uh, going to do something fun here. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. If you go to your social media channel and post and tag Bishop on Air on X, on Facebook, on Instagram, if you're not already following me, you can follow me. Just search Bishop on Air. And if you post publicly why you listen or check out Bishop on Air, I've got all kinds of things that uh, Megan and I are going to do for you. Uh, you can either, you know, send you one of the Bishop on Air stickers. Uh, we've also got uh, some of the, the testers that we got in for the merchandise, a t-shirt, uh, also a couple of different hoodies, so you can uh, check those out as well. Uh, so if you post publicly why you listen to Bishop on Air, we're going to send you some stuff. So we'll uh, communicate with you, get your, get your uh, address so that we can send you uh, whatever we've got here. And um, we're going to make the determination, of course, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a giveaway uh, just kind of to usher in uh, getting some merchandise and whatnot and getting people interested. So again, if you go to your social media channels and tag Bishop on air and explain why you listen, uh, we'll see that and uh, we'll connect with you and, and try to get you some of these items. Something else too uh, that's really cool and actually from when I made that documentary, Gun Free Zone the movie, uh, I distributed it via USB and I found a bunch of different firearm shaped USB devices. So uh, people who supported the documentary back then, which it wasn't a lot of people, but still, um, it's got the, the, the magazine is the USB. So I've got uh, several of these fun little uh, kind of trinket of sorts. I've got a, a rubber one, like a Glock of sorts, and it's got the, the USB here. Uh, I have a funny story about this, which I'll have to share, but uh, I may be able to send you one of those as well. So we've got uh, some, some giveaways. I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, share, again, why you listen to Bishop on Air uh, on your social media channels. We'll see that, and we will connect with you and try to, try to get you some of these items just as a way of saying thank you for tuning in. But again, don't forget, you can check out the store. Uh, just go to my website, bishoponair.com, or on the YouTube channel, and you can find uh, you know how to, how to buy some of these items and support the show. Uh, so uh, greatly appreciate everybody tuning in. It's been incredible growth. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this. Stay tuned. We will get to Gun Free Zone, the movie, uh, and uh, kind of do some commentary and talk with people in the chat room as well. Some of you may have seen this. Others may not have, but uh, I think it'll be a good history lesson especially where we find ourselves today with the litigation against Illinois gun and magazine ban and the registry, which is going to be January 1st, that deadline, or else you'll face criminal penalties. Uh, so we'll get to all of that. I promise. Stay tuned. It's coming up next. Hey.
right. I uh, want to definitely give a shout out to uh, Fish and Golf, too. Uh, good evening. Uh, he was the first one to, to say something. Also, uh, a bunch of you others out there kicking a the wing. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's good to see you here. Uh, if I could, a Thursday night special. That's uh, that's what we're doing here, the stream. Jerry, thanks for checking in. Uh, kicking wing, uh, thanks for uh, also saying best show ever. Uh, we've even got, uh, I believe, uh, Freedom Steel. Uh, love to snag a few stickers. Uh, well, I've got stickers. All right. So again, just a reminder, if you uh, share on your social media channel uh, why you listen to Bishop on air, uh, well, if we'll see it, uh, we'll connect with you and try to get you some of these items. All right. Without further ado, uh, Gun Free Zone, the movie. I uh, saw this happening as I was covering the Illinois State House early in my career back in 2012, seeing the progression of lawsuits and Heller and McDonald and, and uh, a variety of other lawsuits out of uh, Washington, D.C., all about the, the issue of carrying, right? Because we know what the Second Amendment is. It's the right to keep and bear arms. While you could keep arms in Illinois, it was like the last state to actually allow for individuals to carry firearms outside of their home for protection. So I figured I would track this and how it came about at the state house. Uh, so without further ado, here we go. Gun Free Zone, the movie, uh, where I'll also be chiming in here and there and uh, maybe sharing some of the things from the chat as well. Uh, so let's get right on into it. To own and carry firearms is a fundamental civil right. The Second Amendment is so important because it gives teeth to freedom of religion, speech, press, and peaceful assembly. But, until recently in this country, there were states that denied citizens the right to keep and bear arms. One of the last holdouts was the land of Lincoln, Illinois. Until spring of 2014, Illinois citizens were barred from carrying a firearm outside of the home. The courts changed that. Even with the right to bear arms now secured in law, there are still severe limitations. Okay, okay, okay. And this is, uh, of course, during an Illinois Welcome gun owner to lobby to day, 2014. You, first of all, to look up. Tom Schaefer, local look gun up. rights activist. Is that gorgeous or what? The rotunda <laughs> of the state capital of the state of Illinois. It's beautiful. It's one of a kind. It's the best in the country, and I've seen them all over. I also, before you leave, we did a $50 million reconstruction of this building with your money, Arch Skylight. I want you to go up there, and I want you to let the heavenly light through the Arch Skylight at the top of that 50-foot mural just let it bathe over you. If you've never been to the Capitol, it is it is pretty incredible. Uh, now I would like, uh, definitely encourage like you to, to check it out. Get to Springfield to sometime. Linda Rowe, and she is going to become our favorite cheerleader today. And what's great is uh, you'll notice a lot of these names still around, arguing for the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, around us, like Indiana, our neighbor, people could carry a firearm to protect themselves. We like, Why is this the case in Illinois where we're forbidden from protecting ourselves in a situation like this. We're law-abiding people. You know, it's not like we're criminals. We just need to be able to protect ourselves. You cannot, I cannot make you safer by preventing you from protecting yourself. This is our uh, chance to celebrate. This is our victory that we do have a shall issue law with statewide preemption, but we're also here more importantly to send the message to our legislators. And that message is that gun-free zones are killing zones. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Rewind to the first quarter of 2013. The last six months of the past year, the right to keep and bear arms has become a hot political issue. But there is no place in our state for military style assault weapons designed for rapid fire at human targets at close range. I don't see a legitimate sporting or hunting purpose 
to an assault rifle or to a hundred round clip. I just don't see it. it. Does the Second Amendment have anything to do with hunting? Of course it and, does, and read the opinion. In the midst of maddening conversation about which firearms should be banned and which teachers could be armed, for the past 50 plus years, Illinois has been without the right to keep and bear arms. If somebody drags me into an alley with the intention to do ill will, I am supposed to stick a tongue depressor down my throat and throw up on them. <laughs> and that made me want to throw up. I, I could not believe that that was the Illinois State Police's recommendation and that that's what they would tell their daughters to do. So that's my introduction into firearms. Illinois is the last state to allow for operable firearms to be carried in public by law-abiding citizens. Uh, the Seventh Circuit said an absolute ban, which is what Illinois has, uh, in their opinion is unconstitutional. And provided for a deadline. And let's be clear on this. I don't think a lot of people understand this. After 180 days, constitutional carry will set in. I think, I think four other states in this country has constitutional carry. That means if you have a valid Ford card in this state, you can carry pretty much anything you want, wherever you want. This is the story of Illinois getting the right to bear arms. In about 2004, I found online this website called Illinois Carry that had been established by a gentleman in uh, central Illinois that felt the same way we did because when we first got into this, my husband and I thought maybe we were the only ones that thought, no, thinking that Illinois didn't have a carry law. Maybe we're the only ones that are upset about this. But we and, and I already know, I, and I'm going to jump in here from time to time, I need to remaster this. I need to uh, and, uh, rework some of the audio also, and uh, maybe even make it uh, high def because, again, I mean, this was so a group of us from almost 10 years ago. Well, you know, uh, but the conversations, I think, are important to, to encapsulate. But, you know, Valinda Rowe uh, with Illinois Carry, even back then, was, was really adamant on making sure that uh, the public knew what was the law in Illinois and the various channels to you know, stay plugged in and still very active today, IllinoisCarry.com. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check that out. But I know that the, the interviews, especially with Linda and uh, Mary Shepard, uh, they definitely need to have the audio tweaked and uh, and, and and modified a bit. So uh, hopefully you can bear through that with me. Legislators and demanding that a law be changed. Two, you need to get women involved because in every state that passed concealed carry, when legislators who had previously been against concealed carry were asked, what changed your mind? Why did you change your vote in support of this? And they said, well, when the women in our districts started approaching us and telling us that they wanted the right to be able to protect ourselves, it was a whole lot harder to look them in the eye and say, no, you don't need the right to be able to protect yourself. It changed their mindset. They began to realize the need. And the third thing they said is it's probably going to take you about 10 years, so you better get started now. And that was in 2004. And in 2014, I now have a concealed carry license. So we, we fought this battle on three fronts. The um, oh, legislative front, and that is getting people to contact their legislators and convincing them that we need to change the law. We fought it on the judicial front, where we would bring legal cases forward in the court to force the hand. And third, we fought it on the electoral front in encouraging people to vote for candidates that supported their right to carry. Not necessarily candidates who said, I support the Second Amendment, but push them to the point and say, I understand you support the Second Amendment. What I'm asking you is, do you support my right as a legal citizen to carry a firearm on my person to protect myself and my family? That was the key question. And I think it was those three things coming together is what made the difference. It was the judicial front that forced their hand and said, you must provide some legal means for people to carry. 
And uh, one of the individuals that I had asked to be one of our speakers said, there's going to be a lady there. I'm pretty sure she's going to attend. I would love for you to meet. Her name's Mary Shepard, and she's been taking you know, our classes. And she's just a wonderful person. would like for you to meet her. Well, I had taken about five other, five classes inside the home, outside the home, and what have you, before all this happened. Here was this little fireball, you know, you just, her eyes just sparkled and she was And I do want to just uh, warn you, um, this is a pretty brutal story, uh, Mary Shepard's story, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, so there are some, some graphic images here, but, uh, yeah, it's part of the record. time until September 29th. 2009, I was at work in the First Baptist Church of Anna when I was assaulted. And so I said, well, I think I'll go in my room, my office, and run the trial balance because it's the end of the month, and uh, then I'll go home. And that was about 10 to 3. And the next thing I knew, I woke up on the floor in my office. I got up, and the first thing I did was look, and I thought, how did everything in my purse get on the floor? And I, not realizing I had blood all over me, I picked up everything, stuck it back in my purse, and then, uh, as my usual habit, at four o'clock every day when I get ready to leave, I go to the washroom. Walking down the hall, not knowing that anything was going on, not knowing that I was dragging my hand down the side of the wall covered in blood, and I get to this one classroom, and there's this lady sitting in there, and she's, uh, her back's towards me. And then I thought, I don't know that lady. I better go get past her. So I turned around, and I walked back to the main part of the office and passed out in the visitor's chairs. And that's when Pastor Tony came out and found me. The... Uh, Medical team was there, the, the police were there, the sheriff was there, and uh, I was on the way to the hospital. See, I don't remember the actual meeting. I don't, I don't know anything about that part, just from what I've been told, you know, that this happened. He's in jail for 24 years because of this. Mm -hmm. Was in and out of that church 24-7. And it never occurred to me that anything, I figured I was safer there than any place in that building. Later, when we heard the news that two women had been attacked in their church, you know, I thought, oh, you know, and Anna, we didn't know it was Mary. I just, you know, your heart just goes out in compassion for these two ladies that were attacking, and it just strengthens your, your resolve and that we need the right to be able to protect ourselves in this state. Then a few hours later, we found out, it was our friend Mary, and that lit a fire in me like you cannot believe. To think that she had two concealed carry licenses in her purse that day, but no firearm because she lived in the state of Illinois was just outrageous. It was outrageous, and I thought, this, this is the kind of stuff that has to stop. And then um, there was the opportunity to find legal counsel and possibly go forward with a lawsuit for Mary's right to be able to protect herself. People were skeptical, skeptical about where this was going to go. And clear up to when we got the ruling, because you just never know in the Illinois, you know, we are a different bird here. Uh, that's so I got to thinking about this, uh, probably in 68, I guess, is when they started really infringing on with the Foyd Act and so forth. So we've gone nearly 50 years of a negative viewpoint of gun ownership in the state of Illinois. And even in Chicago, two whole decades or more where they couldn't even own a handgun. So we had a lot to overcome as far as mindset and perception of owning guns, let alone carrying one on your person for personal protection. Ladies and gentlemen, Otis McDonald. He's the father of the Second Amendment in the state of Illinois. A wonderful man. And his part in all of this is that the court could never have ruled in Mary's favor if Otis McDonald hadn't first brought the Second Amendment into the state of Illinois. Uh, Dick Heller sued uh, DC, Washington, D.C., because it banned his right to own a handgun in his home. And he won. 
but it only affected Washington, D.C. because it was uh, the District of Columbia. It wasn't a state. So uh, when Otis McDonald, who lived in Chicago and did not have, could not own a handgun in his own home to protect himself with because of this ban in Chicago, uh, he went forward and a lawsuit was placed on his behalf. He won. It went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Thank you all. Each, <clears throat> each and every one of you that have supported this venture. Thank you. We have needed it. The, um, the journey wasn't so long, but it was uh, a hard one. And um, when he won, that incorporated the Second Amendment right to keep and own a firearm in your home to the state of Illinois and all the states. So from history on, from that point on, anytime you talk about the Second Amendment, Mr. Otis McDonald's name will be mentioned in that uh, McDonald versus Chicago. I want to say to all the people in here, I thank you again. I love you from my heart. I feel that you all have supported me, have given me the strength to do what I have done. Never did I have a dream or even a thought of a dream to have done what I have done or done what people have joined with me and lift me up through things I never knew where I was going half of the time. And, 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 and uh, but they, they were there supporting me and I was just walking along. <laughs> it was just, they just had me going. And I think, Thank all of you. I will say I am uh, sad I never got a chance to sit down and talk with him, but uh, it's part of history, no question. Up to the, the right to carry. Once the Second Amendment was the right to own in your own home, was incorporated into the state, then we could come back with Mary's case and say, okay, owning it in our own home is not enough. We have a constitutional right to carry that with us when we leave our home. And based on that platform of McDonald versus Chicago, then the, the Seventh Circuit came back and ruled in Mary's favor that she did have a right to carry a firearm outside her home. I want to take uh, just a brief moment here uh, to to remind you again, uh, we're watching uh, a documentary I made back in 2014, uh, released it in 2015. It's called Gun Free Zone, the movie. Uh, you can see it on my YouTube channel from way back then. If you search, uh, you might be able to find it. But, you know, from time to time, I'm going to kind of jump in and, and talk about some things from behind the scenes. Uh, but I also want to remind you as well, be sure that uh, you go to your social media channel and tag Bishop on air. Uh, we're not going to be able to see it unless you tag us. So uh, find us, follow us on X, Facebook, Instagram, uh, tag Bishop on air, and uh, we'll connect with you and try to get you some of these stickers. Uh, also, we'll uh, find some of the best reasons as to why people listen. So you have to tag us and tell us why you listen. Um, we'll hook you up with uh, either a T-shirt or uh, one of two different uh, hoodies uh, that we have here so you can uh, get yourself hooked up. Uh, but I also have uh, some of the Gun Free Zone, the movie original release on USB. Uh, and it's a little gun-shaped USB drive. Uh, it's got the, the magazine is the uh, USB drive. And I, I promise it's probably... Uh, only capable of holding about uh, 4 gig, not uh, 16 gig. So I think you'll be all right there. But we've also got, I think, a Desert Eagle uh, type of USB drive. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, do what you can. Uh, if, you, if you're able to, to, you know, post on social media uh, and, and share why you listen to this program, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to get you some stuff. I got a few more uh, stamps, or not stamps, but uh, patches as well. I know tons of people wanted those patches. But just to kind of reset here, because uh, this was back in 2014 when I got a lot of these interviews. And uh, some of these names and faces, you'll recognize Valinda Rowe, for instance. Uh, she very much is integral in uh, continuing on and highlighting things through IllinoisCarry.com. Uh, she was uh, there at the third public hearing with Illinois State Police uh, just earlier this month uh, with uh, you know various issues she has with the gun ban registration that's currently uh, being litigated in courts up and down from the Southern District of Illinois to the appeals courts and possibly even into the U.S. Supreme Court with Dan Calkins' most recent case. 
Uh, so you've got uh, Gun Free Zone, uh, the movie from 2014, delving into some of these issues, but some of the names you'll recognize. Uh, Valinda Rowe, one of them. Uh, also, uh, former state senator Sam McCann. Uh, he's uh, interviewed in this as well. Uh, Tom Schaefer, uh, somebody that if you go to iGold, the Illinois Gun Owners Lobby Day, he's always the guy out front in the march before getting to the Capitol. Uh, talked with him uh, for a considerable amount of time. But also, uh, John Milheiser, who was the former Sangamon County State's attorney, turned U.S. attorney for the Central District, and now he's actually back being the Sangamon County State's attorney uh, after Dan Wright went on to be a judge. So uh, kind of interesting to see some of these names still very much relevant today, uh, even, what, uh, eight years later or so. Uh, but uh, back to Gun Free Zone, the movie. Well, it, what they did in this case was say that the fact that Illinois has no uh, version of a carry law in, in their mind is unconstitutional. And the way I view it, and the way I view it personally, and the way I view it professionally as uh, the elected representative for the 50th Legislative District, is that that Seventh uh, Circuit Court of Appeals decision seemed to be very specific that it shouldn't, in, in the way I read it, the way, again, I'm not an attorney, let alone a judge, but the way I interpret it, they, they said, Illinois, you, you've been doing this wrong for, for quite some time and you need to correct it. And I think this case highlighted and went through uh, the importance of um, in, in self-defense and say that, you know, the reason we have the Second Amendment and the reason that they say that there needs to be some sort of carry law is for the purpose of self-defense. Uh, and it also points out that we're the only state uh, uh, in our country that does not have some form of concealed carry or carry. I mean, you, you can walk around uh, inside your house or, or, or I, I presume business with it. I'm not an attorney, but uh, you are correct. Once you, walk, once you walk out your front door, you pretty much can't carry it anywhere. Illinois has no uh, version of a carry law in, in their mind is unconstitutional, but they stayed that mandate. And that's very important in this case uh, because it is not law yet. Uh, they said, we're gonna wait 180 days and, and, and the reason it appears, it's purposely to give the state legislature time to craft a law for concealed carry. And the case goes into to, to lengths to give direction to the legislature. And now the legislature needs to give direction to the public and to law-abiding citizens who want to carry guns in Illinois uh, and, and enact some, sorm, some form of, of carry law with reasonable limitations, and, and the case talks about that. Um, that are consistent with uh, the protection of the public and also consistent with the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. The Shepard decision was handed down in December of 2012. Illinois lawmakers were then tasked to come up with some kind of carry law, but not without a fair amount of rhetoric, hyperbole, headaches, and bureaucrats diverging from the real issues of the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. Is this one of these pro-gun guys who's already testified that you're not gonna, they're not going to give up their guns no matter what laws you passed? What if we were a state where we allowed people to carry guns in public? What if there were 50 or 100 or 150 people sitting around that room, and what if some of them saw that gun and decided, now's my chance to be that hero I've always fantasized myself to be? What if one of those people stood up and people could see that person's gun? And what if another police officer across the room realized that that person was not a police officer? And what if that person pulled out a gun? And what if everyone else started pulling out all their guns? And what if a chair fell over and made a loud noise or someone yelled out, gun? How many people might have been hurt seriously in that ambiguous situation? And you made a comment about the people who won't give their guns back or who will carry no matter what. Those people are called gangbangers. They're going to carry with a Floyd card, without a Floyd card. It doesn't matter. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no demonstrations from the audience, please. 
And this is, uh, of course, during a uh, committee hearing where legislators were hearing from uh, proponents and opponents of concealed carry uh, and uh, a lot of the different arguments going back and forth. Some of the same faces still in the state legislature. And that even if this body put in regulations that they would, as a philosophical matter, insist on the right to carry guns. We're not just talking about gangbangers who are one segment. We're talking about people who have a philosophical notion that they are above whatever laws you put in place. When I was a little kid, I had an older brother and we watched American Sportsman. It was a wonderfully done television show. I never forgot. It. Presents the American Sportsman. guys that liked their chosen sport, whether it was catching a big fish or, or shooting a, a goose or a moose or a, a, a bear, they showed it and I thought it was wonderfully well done. So I guess I got the sportsman's bug early on. I just liked shooting. Tom liked shooting so much he made an educational public access TV series called The Shooting Sport that aired in and around Springfield. He used that as a platform to educate, but also comment on gun rights and politics. There's the hunting sportsman, and then there's the collecting sportsman that just likes to shoot. And I put myself in that second category. I just wanted to learn to shoot a different range of firearms from, from the easiest to the most difficult. And I taught myself over the years, I read probably a thousand textbooks, uh, all the sporting arms, all the manual of arms, all the safety books all the NRA publications. I just wanted to be a, a well-rounded, safe shooter. It's, this is the smart way when you get to be business-like and professional. You don't worry about theft. You don't worry about unauthorized access. You have a safe. It keeps all of your stuff safe. Now, I put my binoculars in there. I put my expensive camera equipment in there, but mostly it's for my firearms collection. And this keeps all the unauthorized hands out of it. I keep the keys in my pocket. It's got a, over a quarter-inch thick steel door. It's expensive, but this is, this is the way a professional keeps his gun collection. Unlike some of my buddies who've been cleaned out by the home burglars, I've never suffered a theft in my firearms collection because early on in my collecting career, I bought a gun ball. Tom and, lives uh, in the capital city where the General Assembly has been tasked to come up with a carry law with, quote, reasonable limitations. The state is under a deadline to give Illinoisans the right to carry without fear of prosecution. Instead, the legislature wants to talk about laws to report lost or stolen guns to police. Law enforcement in the city of Chicago has said, putting aside the merits of carry, they've talked about things they can do to prevent crime. And one of the things they've suggested is a lost and stolen provision that prevents straw purchasers from buying guns, and then those guns end up in circulation. Can you explain why you guys would be opposed to a bill like that, or part of that is the negotiated agreement? Yeah, because we went to court and we won. And the carry issue is separate from all the other issues. Might know if that voice, every year, Todd Vandermeid. About guns in the General Assembly. More so regular voice at these types of hearings. And with that, there have been lost or stolen bills brought to, brought to the floor. There have been semi-auto bans. There have been a number of other things. This issue is about a court decision. You don't feel as though lost and stolen, which would likely garner you some votes from folks that had previously been opposed to House Bill 148. It's you don't think that that should be part of this? No, it's a separate issue. If there's going to be another set of bills that want to be negotiated out or talked about, those are separate issues. And let's not, rem let's not forget that the bill the city of Chicago wants isn't just about lost or stolen. It's about every firearm transferred in the state to create a statewide registry of every firearm sold. Again, I'm going to be It's pretty wild to think about where the, we're at now. The most, uh, I guess, the most liberal policy possible when it comes to uh, the right to keep and bear arms. I believe in constitutional carry. I believe you should be able to carry, open, concealed, or otherwise. The Second Amendment is, it is my permit. It is your permit. Media has now picked up on a gun ban siege type mentality after a bunch of dreadful incidents by lunatics who accessed firearms and used them illegally. Guns are not evil, they're inanimate ob objects. They can only perpetrate an evil act if an evil person or, or someone who's, who's disturbed uh, chooses to use them incorrectly. They can be used for plenty of good as well. They've now put in a, a call for a semi-auto ban 
which is actually a, a, not an assault weapon band, but a semi-auto band, which encompasses about nine-tenths of my gun collection. Uh, they're back on a handgun band. I've, I noticed they've gotten off of handguns, and now they're on to high-capacity magazines and it's what they call assault weapons. That media-driven siege by our government will have at least 10,000 people out. They're rural people, blue-collar people, gun owners, shooting enthusiasts, people who've lobbied before on concealed carry. They're going to try to come out to Springfield on the 6th of March, and they're going to march to the Capitol and talk to their lawmakers again about that now we're the last state without concealed carry and that the courts have weighed in on concealed carry so that the issue I've never seen it as red hot as it's ever been in the last two months my phones rang non-stop for the last two months so again uh, just to reset uh this is from 2013 2014 2015 uh Tom Schaefer there talking about how back then they were talking about semi-automatic weapons bans and high capacity magazine bans and we'll get into more of that but just to just to you know reflect where we've come from then the states being forced to have some kind of carry law because it was the last state in the nation to allow individuals to carry firearms outside their home uh operable firearms outside of their home the courts forced illinois to have a concealed carry law or some kind of carry law um, but even back then the conversations were all oh, we need to ban certain types of rifles flash forward here we are uh 2023 and uh the, the state banned semi-automatic firearms and magazines over certain capacities and it's being litigated so things are back in the courts uh back to gun free zone uh, if they're not involved now in the pro-gun struggle they'll never be but i think i look on i to be a huge success and it was a huge success despite a brutal winter storm slamming the northern part of the state an estimated seven to eight thousand people turned out for the 2013 Illinois Gun Owners Lobby Day. Hello, gun lobby! To lobby their lawmakers for the ability to carry firearms. If the leadership from Chicago doesn't want to give us a clean bill. That's I'll Todd. Vote on a clean bill. Oh my gosh, simple. his hair has grown out so, so much since no. then. We're going to ask our <laughs> downstate Democratic representatives to vote no. We're going to ask our Republican friends to vote no, and we'll kill a bad bill. And then we'll see how they like a court-ordered constitutional carry scheme. Why do you think the city of Chicago is so strident in opposition to the bill? Or at least the proposal? I think because you have a mentality within the elected class of the city of Chicago from Mayor Daley to the current administration that they don't like guns, period. Why? I think they blame the gun for all the problems that they can't get their hands around. They have a violence rate they can't control. They have an educational system that's failing that they can't fix. They have jobs fleeing the city with industry that they can't stem. The bleeding on that. And so I think at the end of the day, the simplest thing for them to do is to find a boogeyman, it may be the gun, it may be the NRA, and make us the patsy. Because they have failing policies that they can't get a grip on. And it's easier to try to point the finger and blame somebody else than it is to sit there and fix those problems, because they're complex problems. All you have to remember when you go to the Capitol today, Two simple things. No bad bill, no compromise. You keep doing that, that's the message you call to your legislators every day. You tell them when you see them face to face today, you call their office and remind them tomorrow. You call them the day after that. When they're back in the districts on the weekends and you see them in the coffee shop, you remind them of that. And you say, if you don't like this, we told you two years ago, Brandon Phelps said it on the floor. You don't like this bill? We're going to court. When we come back and win, you ain't going to like the next one. Well, we already see they don't like this one. Maybe the Attorney General would like to appeal this to the United States Supreme Court. Because yesterday, her and the Cook County State's Attorney's Office filed a brief with the Illinois Supreme Court saying essentially that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals opinion on right to carry is advisory in nature and the Illinois Supreme Court is not obligated to follow it. Wow. I didn't know that the little princess that is the Cook County State's Attorney's Office trumped three federal judges. But then again, I never thought Chicago and Cook County were the capital of Illinois either. 
everything I've been shared for 19 years, I have supported concealed carry. Uh, it was about that time in the early 90s that uh, these laws started gaining momentum throughout the country. It's been shown that in states that have passed this, it's lowered the crime rate. Uh, as good a job as police officers do throughout the state, they can't be everywhere. We're mainly reactive, and it's almost embarrassing to the fact that Illinois is, well, practically the last state to even consider it. It seems commonsensical to say that then only evildoers, only people who are looking to perpetrate crimes, uh, then are armed because they, of course, don't worry about the laws. Uh, they don't worry about fair play. As a matter of fact, I think most criminals are looking for an upper hand, whether it's uh, to commit a petty crime, they're looking for an empty home or office. Uh, if it's to commit mass murder, they typically go to these gun-free zones. And that, in turn, creates the perfect opportunity. I mean, motive and opportunity are the two components of the, to commit the crime. And we create the perfect breeding ground or the perfect opportunity for these mass murders to commit these, these crimes against humanity. So now other states have tried to figure out ways to keep them out of their hands with waiting periods and background checks. Now in Illinois, we have the FOID card. That was passed in 68, and I've had it since uh, 1971 when I got my first FOID card. The FOID card is a firearm owner's identification card. It's required by the state of Illinois to purchase guns, ammunition, um, to be in possession of any of the above. It's an extra identification by the state um, issued by the Illinois State Police. It generally takes you about a month and a half to get back from them once you've issued the application to them. You're required to send a picture. It is a photo ID. Um, I, I will say uh, just briefly here, uh, and again, jumping back in, watching Gun Free Zone, the movie came out in uh, 2014, 2015 or so. Is that right? Uh, but uh, <laughs> about Illinois and uh, the firearm owner identification card, just kind of reviewing some of the, the laws and whatnot. I need to do an update uh, to this. Uh, of course, kind of piggybacking on uh, what happened back in 2013, 2014, 2015, uh, even now to, uh, to where we're at today. Uh, because if you recall, the FOID card, uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, it was months of a delay. 60 to 90 days is what the state's supposed to do it, but there were people waiting a year, if not more. And I think there's still people right now where the FOID card is taking months. Somebody just in the chat live said it took them 10 months to get their firearm owner identification card uh, because of the backlog. Uh, and I think there's lawsuits pending uh, about the FOID card. Uh, and whether or not it's it's even constitutional to f force somebody to wait that long in order to be able to exercise their Second Amendment rights. So, uh, yeah, clearly, you know, I, I could I could spend a whole 30 minutes of going into deep detail about the FOID card backlogs that lasted a year and a half, if not more, and peaked to tens of thousands of people having to wait for their FOID cards to either be uh initially provided or to have uh the foid card um reauthorized uh, and all of the other inner workings of the 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 recent foid card uh, reform that they did making it a permanent foid card and a digital foid card and all of the uh, uh pitfalls there were when it comes to the aurora shooting in 2019 so clearly there's a lot more content out there that i still need to compile and and I, I promise I'll, I'll now that I've got a little bit more time on my hands and especially a growing YouTube channel, we will do some more documentary work to uh, fill in some of the holes from when I released Gun Free Zone, the movie uh, back in 2015. So uh, back at it. Here's more from Gun Free Zone. And pretty much it allows you to handle, purchase or be in possession of anything firearm related. As far as having any severe mental illnesses, those are some of the questions that they ask you if you are an illegal alien and obviously not supposed to be in this country that can stop you from receiving a FOID card. And for years, Richard, Don and I had been fielding phone calls and emails about people not being able to get their FOID cards. It's supposed, it was promised to keep guns out of the wrong hands. It, of course, it's never worked. The, the people that want firearms to further their criminal career get all kinds of firearms. Usually they get junk, sawed off, secondhand, rusty, half working, but some of them that have money from dope dealing, they can buy sophisticated firearms. We didn't ask for the FOID system. It was foisted upon us in 1967 and 1968. And if the government wants to mandate that I have to have a license in my pocket in order to exercise my constitutional right to own and possess a firearm, we don't like it, we're living under it. But I can't make them do their job. 
Matter of fact, it's gotten so bad, we now have lawyers looking at litigation into challenging the 30-day rule that they're not complying with. So I can't make government do its job, and I can't make the governor fund it. The void card, in my opinion, is probably the most, one of the most ridiculous pieces of state fluff I've ever seen. It's about $10, and it's good for 10 years, and it asks you a series of 15 or 20 questions, and, you know, one question, have you ever been a mental patient, or stuff like this. I mean, and then you, you send it in and get your permit. Now you can have buy a medicine, you can buy a gun. I mean, there's no, there's no doctor permit, no background check done on it, nothing, zero. They'll, they'll run a criminal history on you to see if you've been uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, you're a convicted felon or something. But. And so it was the gun lobby that introduced a resolution to have the Auditor General pull an audit of the Illinois State Police Floyd section. And that audit wasn't really flattering to the state police. And now the anti-gun politicians want to use that audit against implementing right to carry. They want to blame us for the backlog of 70,000 applications. They say gun ownership's on the decline. But last month, the state police had a record 61,000 applications for FOID cards. Before the month of March 2013, there was a record of 70,000 applications and reports of people going up to five months without getting their cards. But they want to wait until the FOID system is perfect. They want to claim that it's a public safety hazard because it's not. Well, I'm here to tell you, if it's a public safety hazard because the FOID card system isn't perfect, it lays at the feet of one person, Governor Pat Quinn. It lays at the feet of his incompetence and fiscal mismanagement of this state because when the state police went to his office and said, we need more money to hire more bodies, they said no. And when they put their budgets together, did they put more money in there for the state police to get the FOIA card system up and running as it should be? No. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's not the fault that we won't agree to higher taxes on our fundamental constitutional right. It lays at the incompetence of the governor's office, and that's where the blame should be. Toby Weissman, a suburban Chicago citizen, was there to tell her state representative, Kelly Cassidy, that she wants the right to defend herself without fear of prosecution. Who, who are we going to see? Uh, we're going to go see Representative Kelly Cassidy. I really don't know. What do you know about Kelly Cassidy's stance on this issue? Um, she is very much non-supportive of our Second Amendment rights. and. Um, very much against concealed carry. <clears throat> so do you know what you're gonna, what you're gonna say to her today? Um, yeah, I do. I, um, I'm gonna address with her the fact that I appreciate that she supports my rights as a, as a lesbian and supports my right to marry my wife. But I'd like her to support this other aspect of my life as well. I'm her constituent. My wife is her constituent. We know other people in our area who would like to be able to defend themselves, their families, their homes, and the country if need be. And her stance would not allow us to do that. Representative Cassidy seems like a very nice lady. Um, she does not agree with either concealed carry or, well, I'm, she definitely does not agree with concealed carry. Um, with regard to Second Amendment rights in general, um, she seems to really focus more on background checks and um, uh, lost and stolen and you know, lost and found things kind of <clears throat> which is fine up to a point she's very rigid in her views there and I think that she's one that we'll never win over to our side 
You know, I don't actually feel frustrated. Um, I kind of, I really knew coming down here that that's what I was going to get. But at least, um, at least I had a chance to speak with her face to face and give her my view, tell her face to face. Because I've written her emails and I've gotten emails back from her with the same response. Um, but giving it to her face to face, I think, um, you know, it, it definitely gives her more to think about. Weissman says she was able to show Cassidy that not all of her constituents support more gun control. Instead, Representative Cassidy wanted to talk about lost and stolen provisions and other gun control measures. The, the anti-gun city folk who've never owned a gun, never shot a gun, don't know anything about firearms except hate, and then it leaves the, the rural people, which I consider myself one of, that have used firearms safely, responsibly all their life, that have taught, that have trained themselves and other people, and that's, that's a divide that I've, I'm not able to overcome. I don't think the courts will be able to overcome it. The courts will demand some kind of redress, but it certainly won't be what, uh, a kind of bill that I would write. It'll be something horrible that I'll have to live with. Even after upwards to 8,000 Illinois citizens from around the state converging on Springfield to push for a carry bill, there's still a few months before the deadline to approve a law, which means there's plenty of time to muddy the waters with issues outside of the right to keep and bear arms. Okay, so what progress is being made right now on these bills? We've heard rallies from both sides, but I've heard also that, you know, it's time to actually negotiate. Something has to get passed, otherwise the NRA wins. Oh no, I think we're making good progress. Uh, you know, we, you know. let me make sure I turn my phone off. Is that okay? <laughs> I, I, I had that go on there and I don't want to have that happen. any interruptions. Yeah, right. Okay. Probably the signs in the back. Signs in the back. Anybody? And again, uh, just to reiterate, we're watching Gun Free Zone, the movie documentary I produced back in 2014, 2015 about Illinois getting the right to keep and bear arms. Every time I see you, you have a different... And uh, hearing from all sides, from the people being bust in to be in front of the cameras, not behind the cameras, to the thousands of gun rights activists on the Capitol grounds driving on their own accord. I think we're at capacity. Pretty amazing. Here right now. Sit so back and I watch where we've come from this back. point. Everybody take a step back maybe and, and we're gonna get started very shortly. My name's Mark Walsh. I am the campaign director for the Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence. And it is my esteemed honor, pleasure, to say welcome to Advocacy Day 2013. Yeah. For those of you who got up early and came from parts all over the state of Illinois, welcome to Springfield. We pray today that as you have shown us in the past that you have the capacity to touch the heart of the King we pray that you would touch the heart of every legislator here in this capital today. We know that they have the power of the pen to put in some common sense gun legislation. We pray that you would make Illinois a model for the rest of the country as we end this epidemic of senseless violence. Good afternoon, it's great to see everybody here today. It's so good that you came and turned out. You know, when the other side shows up here, they shut down the building. The streets are closed, right? You gotta remember that. We have to remember that. We brought about 8,000 people down the street and filled seven city blocks with over 300 buses, uh, people on their own time and their own dime, not school kids, regular blue collar, hardworking men and women of the state of Illinois. We filled the streets with them and had a rally. Uh, 
th this place here can't even fill up one part of one sidewalk. We filled eight and a half blocks, including an entire convention center. So when they say they're, the, they're speaking for the people of the state of Illinois, they're certainly not speaking for me. They're certainly not speaking for my gun-owning friends. They're certainly not speaking for the people that I know are, are true patriots of Illinois, true gun owners, true common sense, hardworking people. We don't have to bring school children in on a school day and try to use them as props for some kind of anti-gun message. That, that's despicable. And we demand change because we deserve a future. 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 Because, as Dr. King said, our lives begin to end when we're silent about things that matter, right? Because this is our time to speak up, right? Speak up if you support universal background checks. Yeah. Speak up if you want people to report lost and stolen firearms. Yeah. Speak up if you want to support our children from assault yeah. weapons on the streets. Yeah. Speak up if you think it's too much that somebody has a 50 round ammunition magazine. Yeah. Look, this is the last unregulated consumer industry in the United States of America. Teddy bears are more regulated yeah. than guns. Teddy bears are tested for sharp edges, points, flammability, loose parts. How many children died from teddy bears last year? How many? It's because we took the steps to protect children from unsafe teddy bears. Why can we not do the same with guns? Uh, the federal courts have spoken. In fact, as I speak today, we have 58 days left. 58 days until the state of Illinois has to craft a constitutional concealed carry law. We're the last state in the nation to have it and uh, the gun owners of the state demand it. Uh, you haven't seen any problems with it in the 49 other states that require it. As this Illinois legislature is being forced by the Seventh Circuit Court decision to implement a law to allow the carrying of concealed loaded weapons in public places, we call on lawmakers to use this opportunity to pass the strongest possible gun laws in this country. A law that limits guns in places like schools and stadiums and government buildings and public transportation, for heaven's sake. A law that mandates strong training requirements and for permit holders to have an awfully good cause for being issued one. We must balance the Second Amendment with the rights we have to live in peace and free from fear of another life lost to gun violence. As they give those, the same old folks with the same old tired cliches, pastors, crime victims, can somebody bring the two boxes and set them in front of the steps here? Again, this is from 2013. Where's the governor? When the state was being forced on, to yeah. create a carry law. Flash forward now. I mean, it's... We've got a gun ban and registry in effect. And in box litigation in front of 50, ongoing. petitions are but a piece of the 95% of Illinois residents that want background checks. 82% who support registering guns, titling guns like cars. These are just a small percentage of what all Illinois want. And they just claim this, 95% of Illinois is on their side. And I thought, you know, if you're going to make up uh, poll numbers, if you're going to just lie outright, why don't you just go all the way and say 100%? because it's, it's a ludicrous issue. You couldn't find 95% of the people that agree on anything in this day and age, much less to have a poll number that actually says that with, with any reliability at all that 95% of the people believe in what you're saying. I realize that when you're desperate like the anti-gunners are, they have to fudge the numbers, they have to fudge the poll remarks, they have to, to cheat, lie, to win, but to make such a ludicrous statement that their poll claims that 95% of the Illinois citizens are for more restrictive gun laws is an absolutely ludicrous, laughable statement. Connecticut responded when their children got killed. Governor, we want the legislators to support you and stand with you and support the children of Illinois and save their lives. Gun legislation. Governor Heckwin. And so it's very important we remember that our duty, and it comes from Scripture, Father, it says that if you save one life, you save the whole world. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to save the whole world. Go ahead, Governor. 
in his incoherent rambling speech, he said he was here to save the whole world. I've never heard such lunacy out of a governor that I have to be governed by in the state of Illinois in my entire life. What a ridiculous statement that he is here to save the whole world. He's not doing very well at it. We're here to save lives. Yeah. We don't yeah. want people uh, being shot down in a movie theater or a church or a political rally in Tucson, Arizona, or right. going to first grade in right. Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, I wish I'd like to listen to them because every time they open their mouth, they just prove to me that they put their foot in it. So it's been an education for me today. Hasn't been an eye gold rally, that's for sure. I, I estimated they're crowded about 80 people who they had to bus in from Chicago, uh, but it was worth listening to. It's a little cold up here now. No. Kidding. Kidding. Thank you, Governor Quinn. We took a picture of that. It will be made in the next several weeks, and uh, I look forward to signing bills on my desk that will advance public safety when it comes to guns. The NRA says they'll get their supporters to vote down any bill that has any add-ons like lost or stolen. What do you uh, what do you say to that if they do have the, uh, the members there to vote that well, down? Because this issue is about carrying firearms, not about clip size or what type of firearm it is. They're entitled to their opinion. I don't think they represent a majority of the people of Illinois by far, and I think it's time for the... the state's under a court mandate. The state's under a court mandate to act on what's called concealed carry legislation. Uh, we can have restrictions and limitations. The court acknowledged that, and uh, that's what we're about doing. Uh, we don't want to have guns in classrooms or churches or shopping malls or bars and restaurants. That's a prescription for danger and disaster. And so I think we need to uh, work with our legislators who are elected by the people and resist uh, loud groups that uh, don't represent the majority and do what's right for the great majority of everyday people in Illinois. Yeah, you know, it's uh, fascinating to to reflect back on that. Uh, that was ten years ago, uh, and I was asking then Governor Pat Quinn uh, about this court mandate. This mandate saying it's not about you know all these little things of uh, you know uh, lost or stolen provisions or you know tracking guns. It, it, it was about the court mandate, and that that's what the state then was pun intended under the gun to to have. Uh, so, yeah, just uh, reflecting back on that and hearing some of the questions I asked the governor back then, uh, kind of fascinating. Uh, back to it. Where I stand, and I think that's where the people of Illinois want their governor to be out there fighting for public safety. Now, I mentioned a moment ago about high-capacity ammunition magazines. We, don't, we need to ban those in Illinois, and I think we will get that done. We're going to work very hard on that. Any, any talk about clip size or the style of weapon, legal action or semi-auto, all that does is try to take away Second Amendment rights for people that have never violated the law in their life. They will not crack down on the gangs. They will not crack down on the drug dealers. They will not reform their courts. Should a ban on high-capacity magazines and assault weapons be included in a concealed carry bill, or, or should it be done separately? Well, I, I think uh, the way it's looking now is there'll probably be a concealed carry bill, and then there'll be another bill separate uh, that will deal with some of these other public safety measures. But I'll leave that up to the legislature. If the legislature decides uh, a different course, uh, they're the legislative branch, and uh, uh, we'll, you know, listen to them uh, carefully. The bottom line is not so much how it's done, but to get it done. We've got to get a lot of these reforms done this year by May 31st on my desk, and, you know, I think that's an that, important that step. They forward. believe they have, they're in the right. Of course, they're mistaken. Well, and again, this they is uh, 2013. The, uh, the concealed carry bill uh, did ultimately the pass. They time, didn't bring up they still try to cling to their the issue of uh, long, banning certain long, types of semi-automatic weapons until, well, this year, 2023, so it took 10 years. needs to get some significant reforms uh, adopted into law, or uh, into bill form that uh, come to my desk. Uh, beyond just concealed carry. That, that's not enough. Uh, I think there should be limitations on concealed carry. said that from the outset. But I also think there's other things that need to be done, and they better get them done. The police officers are the 30s and 40s. They carried a six-shot revolver. It's typified by this Smith & Wesson revolver here. Six shots in a cylinder that goes around. This type of firearm was invented by Sam Colt shortly before the Civil War in about 1860. Now this, this gun is still manufactured, it's still used, I still recommend it, and I still shoot revolver. 
Everybody now wants to shoot the semi-autos. I have. Now, uh, before we get more of uh, Tom Schaefer giving us kind of the tutorial of uh, firearms from, you know, wheel guns to uh, you know, bolt action to semi-automatic and the uh, different ways those work, I want to remind you guys uh, to, uh, you know, if you want some swag, uh, I've got swag. All right, so uh, let's do this. Get to your social media, all right? I want you to tag me, Bishop on Air, publicly and tell me why you listen or check out the program, why you subscribed on YouTube, for example, why you follow me on Twitter or Facebook or wherever. And if you do that publicly and say why you listen, uh, I've got some stuff I'm going to be uh, able to hook you up with. All right. So uh, we'll see that and we'll connect with you via private message, get some info. And I got some uh, Bishop on Air stickers that we'll give, uh, give away. I've also got um, some t shirts. Uh, you can uh, obviously uh, get uh, some of these uh, uh, these these makeups that we've had, uh, including a couple of uh, sweatshirts as well. So you've got a possible uh, access to that. Uh, some of you may just, uh, if you get my attention enough, I'll send you uh, Gun Free Zone the movie uh, from 2015 on a gun shaped USB drive. All right, so uh, you can uh, get that checked out as well. Uh, and uh, also, if you just want to support the show outside of telling people why you listen. Uh, be sure to go and check out the shop. Uh, you can go to my website, bishoponair.com. Again, bishoponair.com. All kinds of stuff you can get Bishop on Air printed on. I am going to be modifying this in the future with uh, different types of maybe some pull quotes of uh, things the, the governor said or things that uh, you know legislators have said or or the courts have said. Uh, so this is going to be updated uh, regularly, but you know, grab yourself uh, a Bishop on Air shirt uh, or uh, a coffee mug or uh, you know even women's accessories and and, and clothing. Uh, so be sure to check that out, support the show that way. Uh, greatly appreciate everybody uh, and the incredible growth that we've seen here with uh, with the YouTube channel itself. It's been uh, pretty remarkable. But I uh, just wanted to, again take a take a moment to remind you that uh, this is a, a brief contest we're doing. So uh, make sure that you uh, get to your social media channel and share why you listen, tag us per, uh, uh, publicly uh, so we can see it. Just tag Bishop on air, Facebook, X, Instagram. Uh, we'll be able to see it that way, uh, and then we'll uh, connect and try to get you some of this swag. So uh, looking forward to hearing from you. All right, uh, back to Gun Free Zone, the movie. Tom Schaefer giving us uh, kind of a breakdown of sorts of, uh, well, uh, the different types of firearms that there are. No idea why. Uh, they're nice guns. They're well designed. I'm still a traditionalist. They call this a wheel gun. Nobody wants to shoot a wheel gun anymore. They all want to shoot the big semi-autos. So this was the gun of the police officers in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It was, it was brilliantly typified by two manufacturers, Cole, which I have several of, and Smith & Wesson, which is typified by this one here. And it had six shots. So after you shot six times, bang, 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 you were out. You had to dump the empties into your hand, throw them on the ground, then you had to reach into your pocket for six more rounds, you dump them out into your hand, then you had to put those in these little holes one at a time. That took you forever. Then you closed the cylinder and you had six more rounds. Well, the police come to find out if there was more than one criminal or if he had more than one firearm and you shot your six rounds, by the time you started to reload, he killed you because he had what they called four firearms. That happened in the famous Newhall case, which I won't go into. It happened in several other states where the police officers were what they called outgunned by the criminal. Uh, we should level the playing field. We should be on the same um, playing field as the criminal. If the criminal can carry a gun, why can't we protect ourselves? What good is a ball bat going to do or something? I mean, um, we need to be able to have the uh, same protection that a criminal, criminal has. A uh, law enforcement agency from the east coast to the west coast, north to south, have all gone with the auto pistol. When you shoot this firearm, its cartridges are contained in a magazine. Some people call it a clip. The cartridges are contained in a clip which fits into the buttstock of the firearm. So you fire, now this magazine holds 15 rounds. So you're automatically more than almost triple what the revolver held. Right off the bat, you have a first load is eight, 15 rounds instead of six. And when you start making that comparison, you realize that six rounds for a police officer is not really that many. So they went with the auto pistol. And after you shoot those 15 rounds, your firearm will open like this on an empty magazine where you drop out the magazine, let it fall to the ground, you reach onto your pouch, and you have another loaded magazine that you put into the pistol, drop the slide, and now you're instantly reloaded. It takes about two seconds if you're practiced, about a half a second if you're world class. 
So, but you reload instantaneously and you're back in the firefight, you're back fighting crime, you're back fighting the criminal, when you're not outgunned and you're certainly not caught with an empty gun. The worst thing in a, in a gunfight, I guess there's two things. One is not to have a gun and the other one is to have an empty gun. So that's the only way you win gunfights is with a loaded gun. So all the police agencies have now changed over to the semi-automatic pistol, which is great for the police and the, and the civilian shooting market has followed as well. But what the problem is, is all the crooks, all the con men, all the bank robbers, all the gang bangers have all gone over too, to more sophisticated firearms. So instead of being a force for good, a force for law abiding, a force for law enforcement, they're a force for evil. They're a force for felony, a force for destruction. This gun was designed in the 1930s. It's a classic. Uh, it has a telescopic sight, which some of the anti-gun liberals call a sniper rifle. But this is your quintessential bolt action, four round, telescopically sighted, 30-06 or above caliber hunting rifle. You could hunt deer, you could hunt bear, you could hunt uh, antelope, you could hunt small game pests and varmints, it would be very powerful on them, but you could hunt all the way down to rabbit or squirrel sized animals if you want to. Coyote, fox, just about any game animal in North America can be taken with the 30 out 6. And this is what's used by the what they call the traditional hunting rifle. Very finely made, handcrafted, fine wood, uh, fine cut checkering. And this is epitomizes uh, auto loading rifle. This is our current military firearm. This is a civilian version of the M16. It's a semi-automatic action. It taps gas off the barrel to load the action for every shot. Self-loading, but only one shot for each pull of the trigger. And its cartridges are contained in a magazine, sometimes called a clip, which inserts into this well of the rifle. And this, you, it fires one shot every time you pull the trigger until this magazine is empty, where you push that little button this magazine comes out, another loaded magazine is inserted, and the rifle can be fired again, and that's repeated over and over for how much ammunition you have. Uh, j just to take a pause here uh, really quick, some of the comments, uh, Joe says, squirrel with the 30-06 seems cruel, LOL. Uh, all the gangbangers have Glock switches now, times have changed. Uh, others uh, yeah, discussing uh, the different types of merchandise I could put together, like uh, <laughs> gun holsters with Bishop on Air logos. That's kind of interesting. Uh, magazine, uh, you know, belts with Bishop on their logos. Uh, we'll see. I'll have to get with a shop to see if I can even make that happen. But uh, yeah, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the suggestions there. Uh, more from Tom Schaefer, Gun Free Zone, the movie 2015. When I produced this, uh, he's talking about the different types of firearms from, you know, uh, semi-automatic to magazine capacities and so on. Uh, but uh, more of, uh, of Tom's tutorial here. This is pretty much the standard of what our Marines, Army, uh, Navy are issued for military. This is their rifle except for one big difference. Their rifle has a switch that goes on to auto. This only goes safe and semi-auto. This doesn't have the turn-on switch, which if you pull the trigger on full auto, this rifle would continuously shoot until the magazine is empty. This rifle does not do that. No civilian firearm does that. It's the difference between full auto and semi-auto. This is a semi-auto rifle, but it takes the same magazines, has the same sight radius, it shoots the same cartridge. Everything else is the same, except for that one major difference between military firearm and civilian firearm. Military assault weapons should be in the hands of the military. And if you need a hundred round clip to put in your military weapon to go out and shoot a deer, Maybe you ought to stick to fishing. And again, it, it, this is more of the, the questioning uh, back and forth with some of these elected officials I've had for years now, uh, talking and asking them questions about the Second Amendment, what it means. You know, there's Senator Dick Durbin back then talking about, you know, you don't need 50 rounds in a clip to go after a deer. Uh, okay, that's, I guess, an interesting argument. But the, the question I always have when people raise that is, what does the Second Amendment have to do with hunting? Everybody wants to preserve the right of uh, people that want to use guns for sport, hunting, or target practice to have the right to do so. But that doesn't mean you have an assault weapon. Come on! Don't need that for duck hunting. Well, it's not for duck hunting. It's when foreign bankers take over and want to rape us collectively. This firearm here is older than I am. This gun is 62 years old. The gun is still would still sell, would still buy, still has desirable collector interest. 
and it's still a perfectly functional self-defense or target shooting pistol. So that's another deal. Guns last for 100 years. So that's why you see the secondary market, you see the buying and selling market. In fact, the firearms, these guns would outlast me. These guns outlasted my father, could outlast my grandfather. Guns last a long time. So where were we now? We talked about the transition from revolver to auto pistol. We talked about the transition from bolt action rifle to semi-auto rifle. We'll talk about the only other type of firearm that's out there, and that's a pump action shotgun. It carries the shells in a magazine underneath the barrel. And it's operated by pushing this lever back and forth. And that little sound that you just heard, the racking of the action of an 870 shotgun, is it's called the ultimate fight stopper. It's called the ultimate pucker factor. It's called the ultimate, where, where the police do that, everybody freezes, nobody moves, everybody stops all their criminal activity because they realize, oh my gosh, he's got a shotgun. I've watched all the debates. I've watched all the laws come and go. I've watched the major bans and restrictions come and go. I've seen all kinds of politicians come and go. All right, just got a, a super chat. Dooley, it's not It's not my birthday. I appreciate that. I really do, but it's, it's not my birthday. <laughs> Running joke, I know. The criminal that tried to assassinate Gabby Giffords in Arizona did not have a standard capacity magazine for his Glock handgun of 15 rounds. He had what's called a, a, an extra ca length capacity. And this is the, the 33 round magazine. So you see that you've now more than doubled your firepower. This, this is an enthusiast gun. It's, it's a professional grade gun. If guys just want to practice at the range and they just want to stand there and shoot 33 rounds without having to reload, this is their magazine of choice. Unfortunately, the criminals and the gangbangers have glommed onto this to say, well, I want the most firepower I can have to further my criminal career. So, so the law-abiding guy gets caught up in this, in this desire now to ban, they call this a high-capacity magazine. A hundred round magazine clip. Why in the world does anyone other than someone in the military need that? I, I don't see a legitimate sporting or hunting purpose to an assault rifle or to a hundred round clip. What is the downside of saying you can have clips with only 10 rounds in it? What does that violate? Hunting? sportsmanship if you need more than 10 rounds to hunt and some argue they hunt with that many rounds you shouldn't be out there hunting you can't get the deer in three shots you shouldn't be hunting your embarrassment uh i can't get into that political debate because we'd be here all day but that's the magazine that uh, fits this pistol it could take either one in fact this pistol could take a magazine that only holds seven rounds so I don't know what you're wanting to call full capacity or high capacity or extra capacity. All I know is that automatic pistols take a detachable magazine. I guess conceivably, if you wanted to go through the hassle, you could make a magazine that was, you know, this long. I guess you could make a 200 round magazine. I don't know. It would I, weigh 25 I would like to pounds. see that. It would honestly. be impossible to carry around. It would be impossible to shoot with. It changes <laughs> the ridiculous. dynamics of your gun. It changes the concealability of your gun. You could not conceal a gun with such a three foot magazine as easily as you could this pistol here, which is eminently practical, eminently concealable, and eminently used by all kinds of law-abiding people. So with, with a magazine that sticks out that far, that's clearly, it's an issue that I can't solve right Again, here today. But that's, to reset, that was Illinois doesn't um, even let citizens do in public revolver. what Tom is doing in the Good comfort of his well-armed basement. Illinois has a ban on carrying concealed firearms outside of the home. I don't see a legitimate sporting or hunting purpose to an assault rifle or to a 100-round clip. I just don't see it. It, does the Second Amendment have anything to do with hunting? Of course it and, does. And read the opinion. Or, and the, the U.S. Supreme Court was clear in their opinion. Congress still retains the right to monitor and to regulate the Second Amendment usage. The Second Amendment, uh, what's your understanding of it? Because we always hear hunting and sportsmanship and all this stuff. In your opinion, what, what does the Second Amendment stand for? I think it stands for the individual right to keep and bear arms. For what reason? I think it will, for what reason? You have a right to use your own skills and ability to defend yourself. Uh, I think it was there to put, put in a check to protect the other rights that we have. I think it was put there to make sure um, that, you know, the people always have the, the means to defend our nation. It's pretty simple, and I think they wrote it that way for a reason. It just it's, gives citizens the right to protect themselves and own firearms. Um, you know, we don't live in a, a, a state where it's lords and serfs. That's not what it is. 
and we're not going to have political hacks making decisions about whether or not you know people have the right to defend themselves. So that's what we're left with. The Second Amendment and our founding fathers who, were, who threw off a tyrant, who tried to disarm him so that he could govern him horribly, control him and enslave him, they said, we're going to keep our firearms because that keeps us free. It gives us the, a, a forceful means. Like Mao said, power flows from the barrel of a gun. He's absolutely correct. It certainly does. Whether it flows for good or evil depends on the owner. But the Second Amendment was enshrined in our country's founding document to say, you can, if you don't mess up and you obey our laws, you can have a firearm. And you can use it to defend yourself, to get food on the table, for, for pleasurable pastime, whatever you desire. That's your right as an American citizen, along with the right to a jury trial, the right to a lawyer, the right to free speech, the right to talk about, you know, that your government is messing up. Those, those rights are fundamental. It's pretty broad. Uh, now, they did limit it. I mean, I don't think it, you can own a bazooka or a Sherman tank. But, uh, of course, rifles, shotguns, things of this nature, you know, any, any handgun, doesn't matter the uh, capacity of the clip. And that's pretty much my, uh, my definition. Lawmakers eventually passed a concealed carry bill that requires more than a dozen hours of classes plus a fee every five years. As for the non-issues, the court's deadline came before the politicians could line up support for more background checks and bans on certain types of weapons. After decades of denying citizens the right to keep and bear arms, Illinois passed concealed carry legislation, and in the spring of 2014, the first concealed carry permits were delivered. But there were still unresolved issues about where someone could carry. Illinois is still very much a gun-free zone. Tell me what the imagery is about seeing, you know, it's one thing to have a rally and then go out and be lawmakers, but why march seven blocks through the capital city? Well, it's part of the American right. It's a constitutional right to gather publicly and to address your uh, grievances with your legislators and combining the two in a orderly, peaceful, demonstrative fashion is something that we still have the right to do today. Uh, along the way, the Illinois State Rifle Association Secretary, Tom Burkhalter, was the progenitor of these signs and progenitor of counter, uh, counter demonstrations down in Daly Center Plaza. And once Tom passed from cancer in the late 90s, I assumed the duties, inherited the signs, and uh, organized the demonstrations down in the belly of the beast, Daly Center Plaza, Chicago, Illinois. And along the years, it's just sort of morphed into this. And we would have thousands, thousands of people show up at the Prairie Capital Convention Center. Second Amendment supporters, they are constitutional supporters. So we have Republicans, Democrats, we have uh, conservatives, liberals, you know, from, from all extremes, you know, and, and down the center. One year I think we had eight to nine thousand, the year that we were trying to finally push the, the law over the, you know, the goal line. Now I'm a firm believer in the ballot box and political activism and and this is where I you know I see you know the ballot run. Even in two thousand eight we had a real turnout because we started using the buses. And I looked at this these pictures and what were these people? What was their, their, their message? What were they there for? I got to get these things back out there, and did. And then the, the 2009 pictures, it's like, oh, okay, that's it. And it does this old warrior's heart good when you see five, 8,000 people marching down the street. And then they all start chanting in the Capitol Rotunda, it's sealed carry now. They did building roar. We'll talk about the, the crowd being downsized. That was one of the other things that uh, the Missouri group told us, that once, you know, don't be surprised, you, you'll build a, a groundswell of support, and then after the law passes, 
you know, then your, your numbers will, you just don't be disappointed by that because that's just a common thing that ha has happened in every state because the pressure is off. Yes, of right, regardless of the issue, once you get the law passed. So we knew going into IGOL 2014 that our numbers would, would be somewhat lower. The numbers were down, but that didn't keep thousands of activists who have fought for years from getting together for a celebration. I mean, I've had three mugging attempts, so I can't go into details, but the um, uh, statute of limitations is well expired for all of them. And I did not like the feeling of what was happening. I could see it coming. And I didn't like the fact that I couldn't go to the police for help, that I had to, to rely on myself at the time. My name is T.D. Rowe. I am a firearms instructor, and I am a sponsored competitive action pistol shooter. When I was a teenager, my sister and I were attacked. And at that age, I, I couldn't have a firearm. But if the same thing happened at this age, it would, it would end differently. And, and I would be able to defend myself. I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. Yeah. And that's basically what concealed carry is. It's the ultimate last resort when the bad guy is going to do you a permanent disabling injury or kill you. And you've got to be able to say no. We have ostracized in the metropolitan area firearm owners and people of a self-defense bent. And the pendulum has swung too far, putting the advantage to those who would rather use force against another person rather than reason. And when reason fails, you need the universal translator that says one word, no. It says it clearly, with no doubt, back off, no. After having been successful in getting the right to carry concealed, the 2014 Illinois Gun Owners Lobby Day was a very joyous event. Ollis McDonald, I love you. Mary Shepard, I love you. Todd Vandermeid, I love you. Rich Pearson, I love you. Jim and I love you. Mike, Melinda Rowe, I love you. And everybody, I love you. Last night, right around the corner from here is a little place called Saputo's. And a bunch of us got together last night. I got to eat in the safest restaurant in Springfield. Just so happens, I think there are about 15 guns between the two tables that nobody saw. I don't know how it made some of the city guys who were in there having dinner feel that night, but I know how it felt for me. Ladies and gentlemen, at one time, the fee was going to be $1,000 a year. We got it down to 150 for five years. That's $30 a year for five years. To me, that is a cheap price to be able to protect yourself and your family. Hours. A lot of you have expressed to me, I think the hours are too much. I agree with you. But at one time, it was gonna be over 40 hours. We got it down to 16 with eight for veterans, four for Utah, four for Henderson. Some of the gains that we've made, it's not a perfect bill. Some people might not even say it's a great bill. But let's look at what the other side lost last year. They lost on the issue of preemption when it comes to transporting firearms anywhere in the state. They can no longer create absurd and arcane type of rules that you have to break down the gun and it can't be anywhere close to you in your vehicle and it has to be in a case and all those other things. And again, just to reset here, we're watching something from 2013, 2014, and 2015 when I released Gun Free Zone, the movie. Todd Vandermeid there uh, as a uh, contract lobbyist back then for the National Rifle Association. Uh, now, Freedom's Steel, and I think he's still hanging out in the chat and I uh, appreciate him uh, uh, always being there whenever I, I need a, a, to, to talk, you know, and get a quote on some things. But, uh, you know, the, the, the gun ban that we have now in place, the ban that was enacted January 10th on semi-automatic weapons, there are these restrictions on how you can transfer semi-automatic weapons that fit what they defined as assault weapons. Uh, and, you know, you got to have it broken down in, in a case and you can't uh, have it out in the public. Uh, you can only take it to some place uh, that uh, the, 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 the private property owner is giving you explicit permission to have it there. Uh, if you're found with it or you're found with extended magazines of more than uh, 15 for a handgun or more than 10 for a rifle, which is kind of interesting to, to reflect on those numbers because, as you heard in the debate earlier in the film, you know, Senator Durbin saying, oh, you don't need a 100-round clip. Or, you know, uh, then Vice President Joe Biden's, oh, you don't need a 50-round clip. 
Uh, so then they somehow got down to you don't need more than 10 rounds for a rifle. But regardless, I uh, just kind of wanted to reset where we're at now uh, as we uh, finish up some of uh, Gun Free Zone, the movie. We got preemption for a number of issues, the first one being transportation. One of the places that families need most in Chicago is mass transportation and the city parks. They need to be able to carry there. Going to and from public gatherings, the library, museums, going to and from the parking lots from all those restricted places. We have legislators who want to roll the tide back and take the freedom of choice away from our churches. Mary Shepherd, our friend and loved one, Mary Shepherd, beaten and left for dead in her church by a paroled felon. She went to court. She won her right back to protect herself in that situation. And now, Senator Dan Katowski wants to strip her of that right all over again and ban concealed carry in churches. If you get a chance today, after you visit your own legislator, feel free to drop a note or stop by Senator Dan Katowski's office and say, your churches already have the right to ban carry if they want to. Stay out of our district. Reciprocity, I've got Utah myself, I can't wait. We're gonna keep fighting for that. Yes, and there's too many restrictions. But sometimes you gotta crawl before you can walk. For the first time in 60 years, a Chicago resident no longer has to go down to City Hall and register any of their firearms. The work that Otis McDonald, David, and Colleen Lawson started in that lawsuit, we finished with a piece of legislation that said they cannot regulate handguns. Uh, unless, of course, it's a uh, certain type of handgun uh, that now is considered a, uh, quote, assault weapon, uh, something that uh, the legislators passed in just a handful of hours and Governor J.B. Pritzker signed earlier this year, and it's currently being litigated. Uh, so that uh, gun ban registry, uh, the January 1st deadline is just around the corner. Uh, why, uh, my, how we've come from just 2013 and 2014. Uh, back to it. Not that they can't say something about, they cannot regulate, register handguns, their ammunition, and it is an exclusive jurisdiction of the state. And that stung. The victories gun rights activists and Second Amendment supporters achieved didn't take away from the irrational arguments that were made for years by the state in defense of their unconstitutional infringement on the right to keep and bear arms. On the Illinois State Police website for a decade, because I had been complaining about it, I think, since 2004. I don't have a screenshot from back then to prove it, but I think 2004, 2005 is when I sent my first letter to the director of the state police and complained about this web page they had up on uh, women who uh, are faced with a sexual assault or, or, or physical assault and how they should protect themselves. And it advised women to carry either a rat tail comb, which they're kind of hard to find anymore, but it's a comb with a long uh, spike on the end of it. And, uh, and they're plastic, a plastic comb. And the other thing was to, like a nail file or a car key to protect themselves with. And then they would go on to say that if that didn't work, you know, to stop an assault, that we could gag ourselves into throwing up and that would, I guess, make ourselves unattractive to the attacker or whatever, so. For those of you that have been to IGO before, you may recognize what these are. My tactical uh, rat tail comb self-defense tool and my tactical self-defense tongue depressor. I had gotten my concealed carry license the day before in the mail. So then I held it up and I said, I've traded these for my concealed carry license and a nine millimeter. I traded them in for my Illinois concealed carry license. Even though iGold 2014 was a celebration, there were still concerns among gun rights supporters, particularly the areas people were restricted from carrying, or so-called gun-free zones. 
circumstance where we draw imaginary circles around ourselves and pretend like violent criminals and the criminally and violent insane cannot get in there and hurt good innocent people. They are those zones the very same individuals choose and select to commit their murder and their mayhem and their destruction because they know in those zones they will face the least resistance of any place in this state. Gun-free zones, gun-free zones are killing zones. And the sooner our legislators, Speaker Madigan, President of the Senate John Collerton, understand that, the sooner we can put the right definition on shall not be infringed. At 3 p.m. today, 3 p.m. today, we're going to do something different. We've never done this before, but we're going to rally in the rotunda on the first floor at 3 p.m. We want as many of you to come back to the rotunda at that time for one full minute, long enough to get the message across, not long enough to get thrown out. Okay? Yes. All right. So, I want to practice through that. Just, I want you to join with me. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Gun-free zones Killing zones. You've got it. That's beautiful. Three o'clock in the rotunda. Oh, there's Rhonda Zell. Again, uh, Gun Free Zone, the movie uh, from 2015. You can find the whole thing on my uh, YouTube channel from way back then. And now the focus is more towards holding the ground we've taken, not backsliding. Uh, the the you could call them the antis. They're madder than a nest of hornets being hit uh, about this. You could see that with some of the bills they've introduced. So now the theme is no backsliding and to start working away at all the concealed carry restricted places. Standing tall and looking good. We should be in Hollywood. We've got the the. 23 categories of, of uh, gun-free zones. That's a major issue. Mass transportation being one of those. People who have no other means of travel other than mass transportation cannot protect themselves very easily going to and from on mass transportation. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Are killing zones. Gun-free zones. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Are killing zones. 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 It could be subways, it's the L, it's the uh, uh, Chicago Transit, you know, the, the buses in Chicago, the trains, you know, that sort of thing. I don't know if they have it in, in your area of the state, but in, in Southern Illinois we have the rides mass transportation for our elderly and our handicapped who don't drive. That is their public transportation. And so, you know, they would be limited there. The 16 hours is that's two days. If you have someone who lives in the inner city that has to travel outside the city to get their training, that is a huge detriment to them. It's, it disenfranchises them. They're not going to be able to exercise that right to get out of the city or wherever they have to go for two days to get the training, pay for that training, and then pay the $150 for the license. So there needs to be provisions in there for, for those issues. march down the street, uh, down Capitol Avenue to the Capitol to go in and talk to our legislators and we rallied at the rotunda there. There were hundreds, thousands of us there crowded into the, the wings off of the rotunda and around the rotunda. And we felt like it was important to get the message out to everybody in that building that gun-free zones are killing zones. To Speaker Madigan, to President of the Senate John Cullerton, to Governor Quinn, and that message is that gun-free zones are killing zones. Gun-free zones, you know, were posted with the red, white, and black signs. And that's what they are. That's the way we see them. They're not safe zones. They are killing zones that are an invitation to someone who is intent on creating mayhem and murder. This is the place to go do it. I'm not exactly sure which state it is, but there's one. There's only three. And 
they include prisons and mental hospitals where, you know, people, you know, weapons are strictly controlled. The 23 categories of prohibited places that we cannot carry, we cannot protect ourselves in 23 categories of places, uh, you know, playgrounds, zoos, museums, libraries, just there's a whole long list. And I think it's, it's, we all think it's too prohibitive in where we can carry and where we can't. Mass transportation was, is a huge one. And what we call these are gun-free zones. They are those fantasy lands where we draw imaginary circles around ourselves and around our children, and we pretend that violent criminals and the criminally insane can't come in and do harm. They are the zones those very same individuals select. They choose, they target, they pick, they plan on going into those areas to create their mayhem, their death and destruction because they know in a gun-free zone, they're going to find the least resistance of any place where they would go to commit a crime. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Gun-free zones are killing zones. Gun-free zones are killing zones. We chanted that together for one full minute uh, to ensure that everyone would hear us, that the message would get out, and that we're just because a law is passed, we're not going away. This is a major issue that has to be resolved. And uh, just to let them know, just because they passed the law, it's not all done. We're still here, we're still fighting, we want you to hear us. And I think we were successful that day. Gun-free zones are killing zones. 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 and bear to carry a firearm. So far, uh, we're making good progress on that. But the Second Amendment has a final clause in it that says, shall not be infringed. And so we've entered that new era. Uh, we have the right to keep, we have the right to bear, but we're still infringed. So we've, we're entering into the era where we're going to define and shape shall not be infringed. And a lot of these issues that we've talked about, the, the required 16 hours of training, the high licensing fee, the uh, restricted areas, the 23 categories of places we can't carry, those are infringements. We're not done. Uh, a big chunk of the battle, we've, we've gained great ground, but we're not there yet because of the shall not be infringed. Well, again, where we've come from this point, from back in 2013, 2014, and 2015. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, earlier this year, you have the state passing a ban on certain semi-automatic firearms. That Pretty wild. Self-defense is a basic human right. 48 states respect a woman's right to carry a firearm to protect herself against violent crime. Two states do not recognize our right to self-defense. One of those states, Illinois. Instead of carrying a firearm for self-defense, the Illinois State Police advise women to carry a comb, nail file, or key to ward off an attacker. Demand your right to protect yourself with more than a comb, a nail file, or a key. It's actually, uh pretty classic piece of video clip i forgot i had that in there state police suggest women who fall victim to sexual assault wild and there was another element of uh gun free zone that i didn't get into and it dealt a lot with the militarization of police uh, i wanted to delve more into that um had conversations about drones 
because I think even Al Sharpton back then had said something to the, uh, yeah, coming soon, the imbalance of power. I never got to make the imbalance of power. I need to get back into, it's a lot of work putting these things together, but uh, with all your support, I could I could be doing this more and more, so, um, like yeah, make it happen. Let's see here. Right? We have nuclear weapons in this world, and, and thank God citizens don't have them. Thank God they're not amateur. Um, the, the sophistication of weaponry and force available to militaries, for better or for worse, is well beyond what is available, or in my view, we should ever contemplate making available to private citizens. Wow. What a trip. Yep, entirely uh, funded by the filmmakers, myself, and uh, did have uh, one person uh, donate a couple hundred bucks back then. Uh, low budget, put it together. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed seeing that uh, Gun Free Zone, the movie. Uh, if you want to watch the whole thing in its entirety without any kind of interruptions from me, you can go check it out on my Facebook uh, or my YouTube page. Uh, just search Gun Free Zone, the movie, and you'll be able to find that. Uh, pretty pretty wild to see that. So I appreciate you guys uh, having some fun with me on this Thursday evening, getting a bit of uh, history of, uh, you know, at least the rights to keep and bear arms, but then reflecting on where we're at right now with uh, the ongoing litigation against Illinois' gun ban. Uh, but I want to remind you guys as well, don't forget, uh, giving some stuff away. If you want, uh, you can uh, find uh, find me on Facebook, on X, on um, YouTube. Tag me, Bishop on Air, and tell me why you listen, all right? And then we'll go through and, and see if we can find those. need to make sure it's uh, tagging my public page, Bishop on Air. All right, just uh, you know, tag it and tell me why you listen, all right? And we'll get you some stickers. Um, some of the, uh, the the more compelling reasons. We'll definitely uh, try to get you a, a T-shirt or uh, some kind of uh, hoodie as well, um, and uh, even possibly a Gun Free Zone the movie copy on a USB drive that's uh, shaped like a uh, uh, handgun. Even got uh, some uh, some of the uh, the rubber ones here too as well. So uh, be sure to to uh, like, subscribe, uh, follow along. Uh, I'm still on vacation technically, uh, so I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, and uh, making it uh, worth my while. Uh, and uh, don't forget also, if you don't get a chance to, to you know, get to social media uh, and you want to support the show, you can still do that by simply going to bishoponair.com and you can go to the shop there. Tons of different uh, merchandise you can get from bags to shorts to coffee cups to stickers uh, and, uh, and more. So uh, go check that out as well, all right? Greatly appreciate it, guys. Have yourselves a wonderful rest of the evening. Uh, I'm still going to be on vacation, all right? I'm taking tomorrow off, and I believe I'm off on Monday as well. Got to go uh, hang out with some family down south uh, and, uh, and and just kick back and relax. But uh, we will be back, all right? I promise, because there's plenty to talk about. I mean, we uh, got to get to the latest in the U.S. Supreme Court docketing uh, Dan Calkins's case. We talked about that earlier. Be sure to check that out on the page. Uh, also, the, the case the Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois have back in the Southern District, where they're looking to block the January 1st registration deadline uh, with Judge Stephen McGlynn. And that could possibly come up um, in the next few weeks with a status hearing set for the 21st, I believe it was. And then uh, you could possibly have uh, oral arguments and then some kind of decision before the, the January 1st deadline. But you also have the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, that legislative body that could, uh, you know, take the three public hearings state police had and uh, possibly even suspend the rules. So uh, we'll definitely be watching all of that and giving you guys the latest play by play on those cases and more. Uh, so I greatly appreciate you guys taking time with me on this Thursday night. Have yourselves a wonderful rest of the evening for Bishop on Air. I'm Greg Bishop, and I got to get out of here and uh, enjoy the rest of my vacation. All right, guys, peace out.